Um, this is not really the slot to do deep technical dives. I'm not actually an engineer anyway, but I'm the only thing standing between you and alcohol. So what I'm not going to do is start going to deep dives on aggregation points or how many data centers there might be in a 5G core. You know, first define your 5G core. So what I'm going to do is provide you with an overview of the 5G ecosystem as it is at the moment. Where are we now? Where does it look like we're going? Where do I think we're going to end up in the short to medium term. What are the implications of that? Especially as some of you will work for companies which fancy this as providing, so we're not particularly that slide, but fancy 5G is providing new revenue streams. Uh, perhaps you want to build boxes, you want to build new data centers. There's lots of those coming apparently. Apparently you want to build mobile edge. 5G is also going to change very probably data consumption patterns. So what does that mean? In all of this, I'm going to try and be as pragmatic as possible. I think the viewpoint that we have at Tech UK, which for those who don't know is the trade association for the tech sector in the UK, the point of view we have in the, in the Tech UK is quite wide, it's quite broad, because our members include mobile operators, the vendors of equipment to the mobile operators, testing houses, lots of companies which quite fancy the idea of having a private 5G network, as well as every other company under the sun. I should say there are about 850 companies which are members of Tech UK, about 750 of which are SMEs. The other 100 are the obvious big companies that you might think of. Apple, <coughs> Apple Samsung, Microsoft, IBM, Telehouse, Equinix, the list goes on and on. Um, and as such, we get a very, very broad view, which is, why, which is why I'm able to stand up here and talk about all sorts of things to do with 5G. But what I'm deliberately going to get a message across to you is, if you spend your life talking to people who talk about 5G only from one viewpoint, you may not get a particularly wide view. So, for example, if all you knew about 5G was what you learned from Mobile World Congress then you would probably get the impression that 5G is earth-shattering, it's going to solve world peace, world hunger, and all the rest of it. Actually, it probably really isn't, um, but it is quite amazing anyway. So let's start with where we are now. So all four mobile network operators have launched 5G in this country. That's not a bad place to be. Not every country can say that in part because not every country has four MNOs, in part because actually a lot of countries haven't got 5G from all their MNOs, or indeed from any MNO. Now, this government and the previous government wanted to be a 5G leader. As we don't make the base stations in this country, uh, and as we don't make the handsets either, the only way I can kind of interpret being a 5G leader, if that means anything, it isn't just a political soundbite, it is that you have all four public networks launching 5G, well, job done, uh, that you deploy it fairly extensively, well, work, work in progress, and that we find uses for 5G, because we're quite a creative bunch in this country, and a lot of the government money that's gone into the 5G test beds, of which another one to do with 5G, and this time Creative Industries, was announced this week, oh, sorry, last week, um, a lot of the money that's gone in test beds is precisely looking at the apps. What is it that needs 5G, either because... It can't run on 4G, or because 5G is what makes it fly. And that is a sign of missing piece of the puzzle, if you like. I've described the coverage as being thin and crispy, is a scientific term, um, because we are very much in the early stages of launching 5G in central business districts and other hotspots in, you know, Covent Garden, 5 p.m. Friday, that sort of thing, where you strain the networks at the moment. Those are the places that you build it. Where it gets densified, or turned deep pan, if we're going to maintain the pizza analogy, um, and this is a real analogy, by the way, that gets used in networks, that's going to have to require people to use this, to find uses for it, to buy handsets, and possibly to pay more. This isn't something we've been used to over the last couple of years. So that was the, uh, the interesting new bit. So, how many people might actually get... 5G, and I've deliberately used the adjective public there. I'm going to keep using that throughout this presentation because I think one of the key differences potentially of 5G from 4G is that whereas 4G is something that almost always you get from a public mobile network operator, that's not necessarily going to be true of 5G in the future. Yes, there are some private 4G networks. Heathrow Airport has one. Um, Ocado has some in their fulfillment centres. There are a few in the North Sea. But the potential for private networks in 5G and the expectation that there will be lots of them is much, much greater. So 
Whereas at the moment, we are in a stage where 5G looks a lot like 4G. It's just 4G on steroids, but it's the same networks giving it to you. 5G in the future, potentially, is going to look quite different. It's going to be a mixture of providers. It's going to be private and public. There's going to have to be interaction between the two. How do you, how do you inward roam from a public network onto a private one? How do you cope with network slicing across that boundary, etc.? And my guess, and I haven't changed this view in the last couple of years, is that the mobile operators are not necessarily going to be operating those private networks. I think a lot of them are going to be run by people who are new entrants to this, either because they are one of your trusted suppliers already, so it's no great surprise to me that Audi's 5G network, for example, is run by Bosch, because if you're in the automotive business, Bosch is the largest tier one automotive supplier by a long shot. You trust them. They know you. Vodafone, they don't know you. Um, so I actually think we're going to have some interesting new um, interesting new operators. The bit about returns, by the way, it's worth bearing that in mind. The mobile operators don't make much money in this country by comparison to many of their overseas operations. And this is something the government here often doesn't quite get. So if you're Telefonica O2, you are bidding at group level for CapEx to invest in 5G. You're bidding against Latin American franchises where Telefonica must, makes a much greater return. So if you're Telefonica Group, sitting in Madrid, no great affinity with the UK, it's just another operation, where do you put your money? Do you put it here or do you put it in Latin America? And that is something to bear in mind, because if 5G is expensive to deploy, and it is, um, and you don't make much money on it here, you're going to tend to put it somewhere else. Okay, so how much 5G are we going to expect to get in rural areas? Now, everyone always asks about rural if you wind the clock back, people are asking about rural 4G. And there are large areas of the rural area where you don't get any 4G at all. You get 2G, maybe 3G. I haven't the heart to tell them that 3G is being planned to be switched off even as we speak. 3G will go before 2G. Uh, and in fact, 3G spectrum is being reformed for subsequent Gs uh, right now. So, are we going to get rural 5G? Well, not anytime soon is the answer to that. Um, it's worth saying, by the way, that the key challenges for rural 5G, or indeed rural 4G, are the challenges for almost everything else in rural areas. Low population density, low willingness to pay, valleys, hills. But you add on to that the new one, which is where's the nearest fibre and power? It is worth bearing in mind that unlike the previous Gs, you know, 5G is the first G, where the network planning is fibre-led. It is not radio-led. 5G goes where fibre goes. Worth bearing that in mind. There are still a lot of people in, in government that I talk to all the time who still think that mobile is something you fall back onto when you're outside of Wi-Fi. But real broadband comes off a fixed line. Now, there is still a lot of this thinking, and you will find politicians and civil servants referring to broadband and broadband take-up. Actually, what they don't, they don't mean broadband, they mean fixed-line broadband, because in their mind, real broadband comes down a wire. Slight irony here, because, of course, outside of offices uh, and, and universities and a few other places, the fixed-line broadband you access, you actually access over Wi-Fi. You know, we're done with plugging cables into things, aren't we? And in fact, with mobile devices, you can't do that anyway. And when you consider that a 5G network is a fibre network with radios on the end, you start to think, you know what, there's not a lot of difference between the two. There really isn't. So where's the nearest fibre? And where's the nearest power? Because you're not running this stuff off a 13-amp plug. And if you haven't got the right kind of power going into that base station, I can assure you it's bloody expensive to put it in. It really is. So this is a challenge. Um, government intervention is going to help here. So I've mentioned two things here. Outside in, in case you're not uh, familiar with this, this is another £5 billion of public money that's been spent on putting in... Now, they don't call it full prime anymore. They've decided to call it gigabit capable. Full fibre is what they really want to give you, but actually they're being a bit more technology neutral about it and a bit more pragmatic. So gigabit capable. It essentially, it's fibre, with, but with a bit of 5G radios on the end. So this is something that will start being procured from next year, and it's in addition to all the other billions that the government has spent subsidising the rollout of fibre, which has sometimes left some rather strange... Um, distributions of super fast fibre. If you remember, we used to call it super fast, then ultra fast, we're now going to call it gigabit capable. You do actually have towns where you have donuts of super fast, 
which have been built with public money, so our money, around a centre which isn't super fast, but because it had something, it didn't qualify for the last intervention. And then beyond that donor, you've got nothing. I mean, it's weird. No commercial company deploying it commercially would have done that, but that's the result of intervention. The shared rural network is something the government's still working on. They were hoping to have announced it before Christmas. You may have seen in the FT recently um, leaked emails coming out of um, James Heath, my former BBC colleague, who is now the director of telecoms at DCMS. Um, there is a lot of frustration in trying to get four mobile operators to agree anything because they compete vigorously with each other. They're like four cats in a sack. Really hard to get agreement on anything. Um, but if the shared rural ne network comes off, there will be public money going into pushing 4G out into areas that just make no commercial sense. It is worth saying, by the way, that in the UK, we are very concentrated on population and on economic activity. So there's large parts of the country where almost nobody lives. Um, it's also worth saying that the greater London area, so, so M25 and then a little bit, is about a quarter of the entire UK economy. Now, that is a concentration around the capital that neither Germany nor even France has. It's an astonishing concentration. Some would say a bit unhealthy. But it does mean that if you don't make great returns and you're wondering where to put your money, and then someone says to you, what about Kerry Diggian? The answer in private is, Kerry Deegan will wait, I may never get it. Publicly, you don't say that. All the operators pay lip service to rural, but actually, rural is, is, is a loss leader. I mean, it just is. You know, so when you've got uh, base stations in the corner of a farmer's field, when I used to work for Arkiva that owns a lot of this infrastructure, we used to joke that this was about subsidising the price of milk. Uh, the same sort of um, challenging distribution, by the way, goes on for television transmitters. And we used to joke uh, in Arkiva that most of those were there to warm up sheep. Now, um, it is worth saying, by the way, because as I mentioned, um, outside in and rural shared network, that we have a very interesting political situation at the moment. Since the coalition came in in 2010, if you can remember that far back, um, we had a government that was avowedly market centrist. It scrapped coverage obligations on 4G. I know because I had to spend 18 months uh, campaigning to get them reinstated. Um, it scrapped the idea of requiring in the new building regs fibre going into each profit, uh, each premise, because that was too interventionist. That's now back on the agenda, by the way. This government is going to do that. Um, so what we have, regardless of how you voted in the last general election, what we have is a government with a working majority. This is a good thing. We have a parliamentary timetable which is not dominated by Brexit. They can actually get other stuff done. We have a Prime Minister who cares about tech. He did when he was Mayor of London, he does now. It doesn't matter that he doesn't really get it. He knows it's important, and he knows that as we look towards a future or sort of free trade area land, where well, we have to basically present a shop window to the world and say, please come and invest here, and if you're already here, please invest a bit more. You know, this, these sort of wild open vistas where we compete against Singapore and all sorts of other places, we've got to have good digital communications infrastructure. So if you are in that game, this is a government which likes what you do and is willing to intervene to help make it happen. That is a big change. I've actually, uh, when Boris became um, won the last election, I said to a couple of Labour friends of mine that, to my mind, he is the new Tony Blair. Uh, they didn't like me saying that, but they understood why I said it. Although Boris writes for a right-wing newspaper, he actually really isn't a swivel-eyed right-wing loon. He's very pragmatic, he's a populist, and he will intervene and he will spend our taxpayers' money to deliver stuff. This is a big change, so make the most of it. Um, one thing you can do, other than just spending lots of money uh, subsidising fibre, is make it quicker and cheaper to deploy the stuff. And this is what government is doing. So we've had industry developments over the years. There was a time when each of the mobile network operators controlled their own infrastructure. They had their own sites. They controlled everything end-to-end. -end. You went into one of their shops on the high street. Everything was controlled. That's, that's not the case anymore. The CTOs had to be dragged kicking and screaming to share those networks, but they have done so. And they've done so because if consumers are demanding more and more data but don't want to pay you anymore, you have to cut costs somehow. 
what the government is gradually doing is making it quicker and easier to deploy fibre. It's doing this by looking at all sorts of things. So we have physical infrastructure access, what OpenReach called duct and pole, so that you have a regulatory right, if you're not OpenReach, to go and share their infrastructure. You may not like the cost they're going to charge you, but you can at least get into it. We have something called the Electronic Communications Code, which was designed to make it easier for telcos to access third-party infrastructure. You've got a new bill, very new, launched only um, last month, which is designed to force fibre into blocks of flats and offices. Why would you do that? You would do that because too many of them are owned by landlords who don't respond to requests or they're absentee. You don't know who they are. So if you talk to the Corporation of London, for example, which is an extreme example, they keep trying to get fibre into buildings which have willing tenants. They want this stuff. They can't get it because they don't know who the hell owns the building. It's some Cayman Islands company. They don't know who the beneficial owner is. They never respond. This new bill, which will become an act because this is a government with a working majority, that new bill will force that to happen. We are gradually moving towards a situation of a presumption of, of access. So the London Underground Assets, um, the London Underground Assets Register Pilot, uh, by London Underground, I don't mean the tube, by the way, I mean Underground Assets Register Pilot in London, um, which finishes at the end of this March, is funded by the Cabinet Office. It's worth paying attention to that because what that does is it brings together about 33, 34 companies, including OpenReach, who've all got assets under the ground. And the idea is to see if this can be taken nationwide uh, in a way that any company that wants to deploy fibre in future, instead of applying for street works permits, which is bullsakingly tedious, and then you get fined if you run over and you create disruption as you're digging up the road, the first thing you'll do is you'll go to a portal and you'll say, who's got ducting under this road already? And where is it? And what condition is it in? And where can I break into it? Because if someone else has already got capacity, and it might be, uh, it might be a water pipe, for example, you know, why would you build your own? You know, anything that can reduce the costs drives out fibre. And if you can drive out fibre, you can drive out 5G. Although at the moment, there's still a lot of people who really don't get the interrelationship between the two. And when you deal with local government, and I'll mention this again later, you know, it, it's like pulling teeth occasionally. So we did a workshop recently with one of the London councils, one of the London boroughs, I'm not going to mention which one, and they were pleased as punished to tell everybody that they'd had a competition to select two fibre operators who went along and put fibre into three blocks of social housing. That's great. Um, and I said to them, okay, so they put, those, they put the fibre into those three blocks of social housing, that's fantastic. Did they also, by the way, offer this amazingly fast connection to the homes and businesses that clustered around those, those social housing blocks? No. Okay, what about the ones they ran the fibre past? No. Did they think about 5G coming along, building a you know, convenient breakout? No. Out of scope. Out of remit, not our problem. We did exactly what we were told, and you get this all the time with local government. Um, so in these early days, 5G doesn't look quite like what we were promised. What we were promised a few years ago was that 5G was all about millimetre wave spectrum. This is the really high spectrum, where hardly anyone's in that spectrum at the moment. And the idea was that the operators would have vast swathes of this, and they would shove this at you, huge quantities, much bigger than you get at the moment, and that would give you phenomenal speed. But it doesn't go very far. I think it's about 500 metres or something. So you would be using small cells, which are low-power things that fit inside ooh, lampposts and other street furniture. Um, and that was what it was all about from a deployment point of view. And what were we going to do with it? We were going to have untethered VR and mobile AR. We were going to have remote robotic surgery. I have to say, I always giggle when I see that one. Yes, it's been shown at Mobile World Congress to work, and it's been shown to work in China. That's great. That is never going to be the first choice of either the patient or the surgeon, I would suggest. Uh, autonomous vehicles, more on that in a minute. Uh, but that's what it was going to be about. And at the moment, it's about none of those things. So, 5G starts as an evolution. We are in the phrase which is called non-standalone, or NSA, which I have to say, ever since the Snowden WikiLeaks thing, I think is an unfortunate acronym. But um, 5G is being plonked onto existing 4G sites. Those sites are outdoor macro cells, even though most data demanded by mobile devices is demanded indoors. Um, it's the mobile operators providing this, the traditional ones, the four you already know. It's about cellular, not fixed wireless access. Very different in America, where 5G is mostly at the moment about fixed wireless access. This is the world you know. This is the world of 4G. 
It's just it's 4G on steroids. That's where we are at the moment. It's evolution. So if we are in 4G and steroids time, and it's about speed, what do we do with it? Interesting question. What do we do with this? Because actually, 4G is already pretty damn fast. Most people would like to have more 4G, you know, more, more deployment of 4G, not necessarily 5G, which is about super serving people who already have 4G. 4G is fast enough for almost anybody. And where you struggle, for example, Clapham Junction, which is a known problem, it's a struggle with capacity. It's not a struggle with speed. It's just that there just isn't enough capacity to serve everyone in that spot. So if 5G is about speed, how fast? This is a question people always ask. Journalists in particular love quoting numbers. How fast can 5G be? Well, it can be, in the lab, incredibly fast. 5G, in principle, offers speeds of 100 times 4G. I have no idea what you're going to do with it. Uh, and I always slightly wonder about comparing like with like, because although 5G is more efficient, it's not 100 times more efficient. So maybe we're comparing a massive chunk of millimeter wave 5G with a much smaller chunk of spectrum supporting 4G, which is a bit of an unfair comparison if that's what we're doing. Either way, 5G offers you more speed than you can possibly know what to do with. But 5G is not magic. The laws of physics still apply, propagation still applies. So essentially, what speed you get depends on the same criteria as it does with 4G. Are you sharing that capacity with anybody else on your network? If you've got a 5G handset at the moment, you've probably got blistering speed because no one else has got one in your cell. Um, if you remember when 4G launched, it was exactly the same. Astonishing speed, because you weren't sharing it with anybody else. Um, how far are you from the base station? Are you moving? Are there things between you and the base station? All these sort of things that affect 4G speed affect 5G speed as well. 5G is not magic. It's just much, much more efficient. The much more spectrum bit about 5G we don't yet have, by the way. And that will come later. Um, the last bullet I would draw attention to you, though, because this, is, for me, is a really interesting one. Yes, there will be new versions of um, Wi-Fi equipment, but for the most part, you have the Wi-Fi that is given to you by your ISP. It's not the world's greatest Wi-Fi. You could spend more and buy your own, and it'll be faster. But essentially, the Wi-Fi you've mostly only got at home maxes out at about 70 to 100 megs, which is interesting, considering the government wants to shove gigabit pipes into the back of that. I'm not entirely sure why, to be honest, um, because it's not going to come any faster, and it doesn't reach the whole of your house anyway. So, two interesting things about that one. Firstly... Do you wait till you get home? Ofcom does this voluminous piece of communications market report, which comes out every August-ish, and it always shows every year about three quarters of all the data demanded by mobile devices is supplied over Wi-Fi. Now, mobile operators would say to you, this changes it, and it might do. If you can get faster than Wi-Fi performance from 5G, maybe you don't wait till you get home before you start streaming this stuff off iPlayer or Netflix. Maybe actually you do it when you're out. So it changes the location of your demand and the time of that demand. But there's also an interesting angle on this one, which is that there are lots of homes in this country, although not nearly as many as uh, proportionately as, say, Sweden, there are lots of homes in this country which have no active fixed loan. These are homes who access broadband only over cellular. Now, politicians don't quite grasp that concept. And you will often see statistics from um, Ofcom, for example, telling you how many homes are not online. But when you delve down into it, what you often find is they've taken the total number of homes in the country, and they've subtracted from that all those homes that subscribe to fixed-line broadband. Unfortunately, what's left is not just old people who aren't online, which is the way it's usually characterized. What's left also includes people who are online, but they're online using mobile, because that's just too hard to measure in dedupe, so let's not bother. So it's a misleading statistic. Um, and the interesting question from my point of view is, if 5G does deliver a faster than Wi-Fi experience in your home, do you drop your active fixed line? Okay, so evolution for now, revolution comes later. I borrowed a slide here from one of my larger members, Huawei. You have heard of them. Um, 
The triangle on the right is the one absolutely every equipment vendor shows. They've been showing it for years, and all it really shows you is 5G, when the revolutionary bit turns up, it's supposed to do three things. It's supposed to do the one thing it does at the moment, 4G on steroids, low to speed. It's supposed to allow you to have lots of things in a small space, uh, that's clearly not aimed at consumers. And it's supposed to do ultra-low latency, which is the bit we've heard loads about. That's probably not aimed at consumers either. So how do we get from here to there? Well, a bit of time and a lot of money. So the specs, the standards to deliver all of that is still in the labs. They're not here yet. So you need time to wait for this stuff to turn up before you can really optimize it. Some of those things you can do now, you can do network slicing on 4G, for example, but to make it really fly, as has been promised for years, you need new standards which aren't here yet. Um, you may need new fiber architecture because the open reach fiber architecture, the way it's designed, is designed to give broadband on fixed lines into homes. It's not designed to support 5G. You may have to invest in new fiber to support 5G, which is interesting because that's going to cost you time and money. Millimeter wave spectrum, maybe. No one's quite sure now what we need it for, which is a big change from a couple of years ago. Access to street furniture sort of follows on from that one, maybe. Mobile edge commuting, uh, more on that later. So did we launch it early? <sighs> maybe. The reality is, Marketing departments and the M&As are no different from anybody else want something new and shiny to sell you. And the same reason that um, TV manufacturers will want to sell you an 8K set, even though you don't have any 8K content, people would like to sell you a 5G handset and ideally get you to trade up to a, a policy that pays a little bit more and gives you theory a lot more, a lot more um, um, data than you use at the moment. So did we launch it a bit early? Maybe, but not hugely early. This is an interesting one. Because there is a network point of view where 5G becomes really, really useful just from a management point of view because it is so much more efficient than 4G. So there are lots of charts like this. Every year, Cisco does something called the Visual Index, which has you know, fantastic extrapolations going up of data demand. It doesn't really matter if, if it doesn't quite go up like that. It might take a few more years. It doesn't really matter. The fact is there is a huge tsunami of data being, being demanded by mobile devices. I quote three because three is the home of the, of the data hog. Um, they have a disproportionate number of iPhones attached to three because the iPhone is the handset of choice of the data hog. Um, likewise, iPad versus Android tablets, massive difference in data demanded by those two things. And if you look at the expectations, the three will go from six to 25 to 56 gigs per sub a month by 2025. Holy cow. Now, the good news of this is, if you're a mobile operator, you are selling something we cannot get enough of, which is a lot better than managing the decline of your product. The problem is, you've got to meet that demand, and no one wants to pay you any more for it. So I borrowed a couple of slides here from Boston Consulting Group. The first one shows you your problem. If no one's giving you any more money, do you really want to densify your network to meet this demand? No, is the short answer to that one. Fortunately... You and all your competitors have cooked up a new standard, which is much more efficient, which allows you to meet that demand without you having to densify the networks that you don't really want to do. And if the timing of this uh, BCG slide is about right, it suggests that actually the operators could be delayed a little bit, but by and large, they would have to be investing in this stuff anyway, just to be able to manage what you are going to demand from them. So a bit on mobile edge computing. This has been a large... Uh, a large part of the 5G story for quite a while. There will be companies in this room who are really, really interested in MEC and think that they'd like to be the companies doing this. So let's look at what this is. So this is about reducing the round trip, supporting the ultra-low latency, which is such an important part of that 5G future. What does it mean? Some people have been suggesting that mobile edge computing means that you will have very, very small servers inside or attached to lampposts. Wow. Okay, well, that's, that's going to cost. And anyone who has the joy of dealing with local government knows that's going to take time because you never get anything quickly from local government. But actually, it's also going to be bloody difficult to secure because I'm, I'm kind of assuming that although they're smaller, you do still want to secure them. There may be that what we're actually talking about for mobile edge is something in between. It's not actually at the very edge if the edge turns out to be street furniture. It's actually near to the edge. Nobody quite knows what is going to need this ultra-low latency, but if you kind of assume that whatever these uses are that emerge, that need this, 
that the data that they demand is probably occurring in the same sort of geographic locations as all the other data that doesn't need ultra-low latency, then what you're really talking about is data centers that are probably on high streets. So maybe we've found a new use for all those charity shops. But the real question, I suppose, when we're looking about living on the edge is, what do we need it for? Because the use cases drive what you build, where you build it, and maybe who operates it. So, what do we need it for? Well, there are a few things that get proposed quite a lot. One is smart cities, a very devalued term because there aren't that many cities around that actually are that smart. Um, in the UK, it's a term that people try and avoid using, actually, because it was a big initiative of the coalition when they came in in 2010. Smart cities, well, we still don't have any. The UK government is the second largest spender of smart city technologies around the world, by the way. Only the World Bank spends more, which is ironic because we have no smart cities. So if you look at some of the things that are proposed, you can absolutely see Mobile Edge as being part of the solution. So public safety. Every police officer is going to have a camera around here, beaming information back. We've got facial recognition. We've got visual AI looking at pictures because the, the future of CCTV is not a man sitting eating a donut watching a 4 by 4 screen, uh, four for grid of screens. It's actually AI monitoring hundreds and hundreds of CCTV feeds and footage coming off police officers and checking it against databases and watching what's going on in the background and who's acting suspiciously and do I know that person? Would, you, would Edge be a useful thing for that? Yeah, of course it would. It might not be bang on the edge, but it might be closer to the edge than a central server somewhere else. A local server, for example, although local in a Met Police jargon is not that local. It might be an entire borough. Um, traffic management. Yeah, I can see that. Anybody who's seen the uh, University of Milan simulation, by the way, looking towards autonomous vehicles, of replacing a traditional crossroads, which is controlled by um, traffic lights, who one where all the vehicles are talking to each other and to the infrastructure, it looks like chaos. It looks like multiple accidents about to happen. I mean, it's like this, but the 60% higher throughput than when we drive it ourselves, and no one hits anything. Would it be useful to have ultra-low latency control in that? Yeah, I I can see that. The problem with smart cities is that you're dealing with local government, and that means you've just hit quicksand. Uh, they've also got no money, by the way. You may have noticed this. They're busy closing libraries and everything. Anything that's not a statutory obligation, they're shutting or finding how to get out of. Their house is on fire, and you want to talk to them about facial recognition and 5G edge? I'm sorry, my house is on fire. So local government... Not quickly, anytime soon. Um, mobile AR for consumer, talk about that in a minute. And likewise, uh, autonomous vehicles. Prospect for local peering, absolutely. But what are the usages that might require that? But yes, there may be local peering, local breakout from, from the edge. A slide from another one of my members, this one, Dell. I could have picked loads, actually, to be honest. Um, you kind of look at these uses and you kind of think, yeah, I, I can see the role of edge in that. I can tell you, though, that if you're an ordinary member of the public, you're not in this room, and you look at that... There's several things on there that make you think, oh, I don't like the sound of this. Another thing about local government is not only has it got no money, and it's had no money since 2010, and that is not going to change in the next couple of years, it's also in this country incredibly fragmented. We do not do things in a consistent manner across the whole country. There are an astonishing 155 highways authorities in England alone, and they all do things utterly differently. So if you need access to infrastructure to, to support traffic management, good luck with that. Um, there are 33 planning authorities in London. If you're trying to deploy something across just the central area, they all do things utterly differently in their own time schedule. You just know that 5G isn't deployed in Paris like that. Um, so, consumer mobile AR. Um, I, I did mention untethered VR earlier. I have to say, I'm not a big fan of VR. Like most of you, I played around with the headsets when it was all cables, and some of it is truly amazing. But the moment you require someone to spend hundreds of pounds on a special piece of kit, you just lost most of your audience. The moment they put it on and look like a complete idiot, you just lost a few more. Um, it's also quite socially excluding, to be honest. But mobile AR, where you use the phone in your pocket, I've always seen a prospect for that. What are the sort of things you might do with it? Well, those of you who remember uh, Pokemon Go, delivered by Niantic for uh, Nintendo a few years ago, will have watched kids stepping off um, the pavements the world over enjoying that one. Um, they followed that up with Harry Potter Wizards Unite, which they delivered for Warner Brothers. Three million downloads in the opening weekend. This is big stuff. It is big stuff. But is there more than just games? Well, I put their category called Look Around Me. So if you are in a, in a um, 
tourist hotspot. And this is one of the things that's been tested in one of the 5G test beds the DCMS have been funded. I can absolutely see the purpose of that. Could you wander around the Colosseum and see it as people think it was, recreated in front of you? Yeah, of course. I'd love to do that. And because it's not a document, it's a living piece of Every time Mary Beard has new ideas, you can incorporate that. I can see that. They've tested it in Bath. You can see it in the Tower of London. But who's building that and who's the client? Because if you're doing this in the Colosseum, you've got an edge server in the Colosseum to support that. That sounds a bit like public procurement to me. I don't think you're building that at risk. You might be the only client. Is in fact the Rome Tourist Authority that, that runs the Colosseum. Uh, ditto Tower London, which is whatever it is, Heritage England or something. Uh, Historic Royal Palace is probably actually. But anyway, another one of the many, many quangos. Are they the client and that's a public procurement? Don't know. But at least it does sound mobile edgy. But the property one, now we're all obsessed with property. Don't tell me you haven't stood in an area you're visiting and thought, oh, this is nice. I wonder what it costs to live here. Of course you have. And Zoopla was actually in uh, Mobile Air quite early. 5G will make that fly. The one on the right, while well, they launched last year in Singapore. You can absolutely see that. You point your phone at the house and it tells you when it last sold and how much for. Is there one for sale on this street? Is there one for rent? It will tell you that. This is serving information that maybe Zoopla has paid to be on that. Well, that's, that sounds like a bit like a CDN, but it's a CDN with bells and whistles because it's not like serving up EastEnders where whatever you do with your device and wherever you point it, you, you still get EastEnders streamed to you. This is context aware. It has to have ultra low latency. It has to, what are you looking at so that whatever's overlaid is exactly aligned with what it's supposed to be overlaid with. And it's getting information from your phone. Your phone is telling you not just what you're looking at, but what you're interested in. So it can overlay schools, where the nearest school, what the Ofsted ratings, where are the bus routes. Is this a crime hotspot? Oh my God, look at this. Lovely leafy street, if only it's burglary central. It will also tell you where someone from work lives, where your ex-girlfriend lives, just around the corner. You know, your current girlfriend doesn't know she's still in your contacts. Um, what else? Dunno. But you can absolutely see that as a possible thing. Autonomous vehicles, I'm going to mention this because, um, okay. 5G and autonomous vehicles kind of go together if you are a marketing department for uh, either an Ericsson or um, a mobile operator. They talk about it as if the two can't exist without each other. Complete rubbish. If you talk to anyone in the automotive sector, and we do a lot of work at Tech UK with the SMMT, they will tell you the clue is in the word autonomous. The cars know where they are. They're full of sensors. Okay, Teslas don't have LiDAR, but all the others do. They've got loads of sensors. They know where things are around them. They can read the white lines on the road. They know where they are. The maps are going to get a bit more granular, but the fact is they do not need 5G to tell them where they're going. And this idea that 5G and an edge server on the edge of that road will tell you whether to turn left or break is complete nonsense. There is absolutely no way an auto brand is going to rely on external connectivity for that. What about the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle bit, though? Cars talking to each other. The car six in front of you breaks, the five behind know about it instantly and react. It's what we used to call intelligent transport systems. Do you need ultra-low latency for that? Yes. Does it involve a public network? Not obviously. Does it involve a server anywhere other than what's on the vehicles? Uh, not obviously. This is a mesh network between vehicles. The one bit I can see an edge server being is a traffic management bit, the vehicle to infrastructure. You're talking to road signs and they're talking to you. They're telling you useful things, hopefully, and you're telling them useful things. I can absolutely see a role for edge in that. But again, local government, quicksand, they've got no money. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. It's also worth bearing in mind why they, with autonomous cars that when the former head of Google's uh, autonomous uh, division, Waymo, said a few years ago that the first 90% of trying to get to autonomous cars was easier than the last 10, he's absolutely right. It's also worth bearing in mind that when these autonomous cars have finished their trials in Phoenix, Arizona and actually go out on the roads, what they are optimised for is nice, wide, straight roads with no roundabouts and not many pedestrians. Great, that's not what we have here, actually. Um, and trials have shown that people change their behavior around autonomous cars. They really do. When pedestrians see a car coming and they know it's autonomous, they know it's going to break. So they'll step off the curb in front of it, because why not? They know it's going to break. You've got to be able to factor that in. That is really hard. Industry 4.0, we've heard a lot about. There's got to be lots of public policy challenges resulting from this because we're talking about the future of work. No government really wants to address that. It's a bit like pensions reform. But the fact is, 5G is 
the golden thread that enables it all. If you have any form of machinery that's controlled by wires, you want to get those wires out of the way for health and safety reasons. You want them controlled wirelessly. Actually, although I'd laugh at remote robotic surgery, there is an actual role for using 5G in operating theatres for controlling surgical machinery when the doctor, when the surgeon is actually already in the room. Why would you do that? Because if you take the wires out of the equation, you don't have to disinfect the wires between operations. So it boosts productivity, and it's healthier. There's going to be a fantastic role for 5G in that, mostly Private networks. Oh, and as if by magic, a slide on private networks. Okay. Private networks, um, one of the interesting things that come out of the test bed, which is based in Worcestershire, which is focusing on a couple of manufacturing companies, is that they need an awful lot of hand-holding. They've never had a private network before. Some have got them. Most people haven't. If you've never had one before, it's really hard to know what you're going to do with one. And those who have got them often got them for a specific use case. So Heathrow is a 4G network. Why does it have a private 4G network? Because a few years ago there was snow over winter and he knocked out Heathrow and Gatwick and the newspapers were filled with breathless stories about isn't it disgraceful, Heathrow's got no snowplows. Heathrow did have snowplows, they just didn't know where they were. Now, you're all saying, how can that be? Snowplows are big. Well, I can tell you, the army lose tanks and they're bigger. And I am not making that up. So sometimes you get these networks for a particular use case, and then once you've got it, you think, well, oh, this is jolly useful. But before you get it the first time, there's a big evangelism piece to be done here. There really is. And if Boris wants the UK to be one of the leaders in industry 4.0, because we're going to have to be ultra-competitive in the future, otherwise we're dead, then there's a role possibly for the government in pushing this, because the MNOs do not have those sales channels. They can sell a company airtime for their corporate handsets. This is a very different conversation. There are only six people in Germany, all working for one of the MNOs, who are talking to companies about this. And Germany's got a much bigger manufacturing sector than we have. Six. How many have we got? I don't know, but I'm guessing it's fewer than six. And the vendors aren't doing this really either. Um, who holds the software? The, the Spectrum license, you might say, I don't care. If you're a mobile operator, you do. Because one of the things you always used to rely on was that you had the Spectrum that all this standardized kit worked in, all this 3GPP kit. You had the Spectrum. You had it exclusively UK-wide. Ofcom has introduced some new proposals which blow coaching horses through that. Other people can now get access to the Spectrum where you're not using it. That you paid lots of money to buy. That changes things enormously. Network slicing. You've heard a lot about this, um, the operators are having slightly different thoughts about what this might mean, because they've had companies like, um, let's say DHL, come to them saying, we'd like a slice over the whole of the UK. And they kind of think, great, we'll bank that, future sales, great. But then more they think about how complicated it's going to be, the fact that they're going to have to have invest in over capacity to make it work, they're worrying about how they price it, and they're kind of thinking, actually, you know what, it might not make sense for DHL to have a slice over the country. But what we might do is have a slice which is optimised for their user demand characteristics because the likelihood is that UPS have the same demand characteristics and they can dip into the same slice. So what you actually end up with is different slices optimised for different bundles of user characteristics. This is in the future. So you can do network slicing now with 4G, but it's really going to take 5G and a couple more um, technology refreshes before it really flies. But it is complicated. How do you roam from your slice of Vodafone's network onto your private network and back again? There's a whole load of stuff on this. It really is. So in summary, honestly, summary. Our 5G network, um, our 5G future. I'm a huge believer in 5G. If you've sat through this and said it's still thinking, you know what, this is very glass half empty stuff. It really isn't. I'm just being pragmatic because I do not believe in technology push. I've got loads of member companies who do. I don't. I always ask them, that's great. Wonderful technology. I like the sound of that. What's it for? Who's paying for it? Because it's amazing how often people then shut up. And I'm always astonished how many startups say, look at this technology. But when you ask them what the market is, they have absolutely no bloody idea. And I think, my God, you raise money off that. Um, so this future, fascinating future of 5G. Loads of opportunities presenting itself. It's not going to be happening anytime soon. This is a 5G future that is a few years away. It is going to come. Um, a lot of it will be built by other companies, systems integrators, the Bosch's of this world, the CGI's, etc., to supplement the public networks. This is a huge change from 4G. They'll have their own supply chains, which is going to be interesting from a resilience and security point of view. Um, but we are a long way from that future. We are very much in 4G on steroids. Nobody quite knows what you need 5G for. I did say 5G was a fibre network with the radios on the end. It's worth saying that nobody who's in the fibre game knows what that's for. 
So if you're open reach, your biggest worry is that you are investing shed loads of money in fiber. You've got a 20 year payback. You only get a business rates holiday for the first five of those, and then you get walloped even if no one's subscribing. Lots of people you could deliver full fiber to don't take it. Why don't they? Because consumers do not generally buy stuff until they need it. And there were lots of consumers, myself included, who haven't even paid for the fastest non-fibre tier that their ISP could provide them. Why? For the same reason I don't drive a pickup truck or an estate car, my uses do not require it. And I know that it's not rare. It's not going to become rare in the future. In fact, quite the opposite. If my uses change, I can buy an estate car later. I can trade up to fibre later. That is open reaches problem and all the alternative networks as well. What's fibre for? What's 5G for? What's mobile age for? So, as I come to the end of this coming in, I would just say, leave you with that, that thought, that what we really need is uses preferably other than games, uh, although it's still worth five billion a year, the game sector in this country is still we're rather good at it. Um, what are the uses of the public network? Because until you get to the private network bit, we're in the stage where the public operators are investing lots of money. And unless they invest in deploying more 5G and we take up the handsets, people aren't going to develop the use cases and the whole thing runs into the buffers. So what is it that we are going to be using in five years' time that is going to need 5G? And when you ask questions like that, people invariably think about things they've read about that have been worked on in labs. Maybe. Actually, things take a lot longer to turn up than you might think. And the answer may be something that's already here. So just look around. Amara's law still holds, which broadly speaking says we tend to um, overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term. Things take longer to turn up than you expect. There are very few overnight successes. Most things that look like an overnight success have actually spent a long, long time becoming an overnight success. I suppose one of the ultimate examples is probably Nespresso, which you may have first heard of when gorgeous George used to advertise it. And in fact, Nestle spent 25 years trying to get that off the ground before George did it for them. Um, so look around the likelihood is what you're going to be using in 2025 that you're not already using is probably already here somewhere. So what have we not noticed? And this last slide, I always think, is a wonderful example of what now looks like so obvious. If we look back and we think of the car, we kind of think, ah, oh, it must have been so obvious that the car was going to displace the horse. Well, I assure you, it wasn't at the time. 1898. World cities filled with, short, with, with um, horse manure, as they had been for hundreds of years. No one, not one delegate, recognised the cars that were trundling around outside the building where they held that conference, but that was the solution to their problem. So if you want to know what 5G is going to be used for, look around. What are we not seeing? That is me done. I'm sorry if I've told you. I have held you back from drinks. I'm sorry. You're going to lynch me for that, aren't you? Um, so I am going to be around for drinks. If you want to berate me or offer me a job, equally open. Um, you can do over drinks later. If you're not going to be around but want to um, send me an email uh, or a text message or something, you can berate me on those platforms also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. <laughs>